First of all, I just want to point out that most of the time when the Bible uses the term last days, it's actually just referring to anything after the time when the Lord Jesus Christ came. Let's look at a few scriptures on that. Go to Acts chapter 2, first of all. Acts chapter 2. Let's just first of all see what the Bible defines as the last days. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse number 16. This is the event of the day of Pentecost where this miracle has taken place where the apostles and the other members of the church there are able to speak in foreign languages that they had never learned before in order to get the gospel out to a whole bunch of people from various nations who had assembled at Jerusalem. They're able to miraculously speak in languages that they had not previously studied. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So notice he's saying that this is the fulfillment of a scripture that said that in the last days God would pour out of his spirit. And he talks about in verse 21 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's referring to that time that was a couple thousand years ago, they were already in the last days, according to that scripture. Go to Hebrews chapter number one, toward the end of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter one. Now, it, it really makes sense that that would be the last days, because if you think about it, the earth is approximately 6,300 years old. So if there were about 4,300 years before the time of Christ, and it's been a couple thousand since Christ, it would make sense to call it the last days, even though you might think, well, last days, that means, you know, any second now, it's all going to be over. Well, no, because anything after the halfway mark could be considered the last days. And Jesus Christ came, you know, after 4,000 some years of human history, and it's only been 2,000 years since he came. But look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So he's explaining how in the past God spoke through the prophets, but that now in these last days he's spoken through his Son, Jesus Christ. Go to 1 Peter, just a few pages over there from uh, Hebrews. Just flip a few pages to the right in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible reads, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Now flip to 1 John chapter 2, the last place on this subject. 1 John chapter number 2. So we see that the time of Christ and thereafter is consistently called in the Bible the last days or the last time. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. Little children... It is the last time. And this is written almost 2,000 years ago. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist, that's singular, Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He's Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So here we see very clearly that they were already in the last time, in the days that 1 John was being written. And he says, look at all the antichrists that surround us. And he says, those that are antichrists are those who deny that Jesus is the Christ. And the word Christ simply means Messiah. And so he's saying, they are denying that Jesus is the Messiah, meaning that they believe in a Messiah, but that it's not Jesus. You can't deny that Jesus is the Messiah 
if you don't believe in a Messiah. These aren't atheists. Atheists aren't saying that Jesus is not the Christ. Atheists are just saying that there is no Christ. They don't believe in God. They don't believe, you know, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But these are talking about basically the Jews who said there's a Messiah coming. There's a Christ coming, but it's not Jesus. That's the spirit of Antichrist that even now already is in the world, the Bible says. Okay. Even now there are many Antichrists. But turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's talk about the last days as we would think of it. Because when we talk about the last days or the end times, we don't normally mean anything after the coming of Christ. We don't normally just mean anything in the New Testament. What we normally would mean by that when we say the last days, we would talk about just the very last days leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible does have a lot to say about that subject as well. And so I want to preach to you this morning about living in, you know, the very last days. What is it going to be like as we see the day approaching, as Christ's coming draws near? What are going to be the characteristics of the world at that time? The signs where we could look at it and say, wow, it must be getting close because I can see these characteristics of the very last days. Well, first of all, number one, the Bible tells us that sin will increase in the very last days as we approach the second coming of Christ. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Go ahead and be in, in 2 Timothy 3. But in Matthew 24, which is a passage about the second coming of Christ, it very clearly says in verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So according to the Bible, the last days, the tribulation, that is going to be a time when iniquity will abound. Sin will increase. And that's exactly what we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in verse number 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. And he lists all these different sins. But jump down, if you would, to verse number 12. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But, watch this, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So what's he saying in this passage? He says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Dangerous times will come. And he talks about all the sin there that's going to abound in the last days. And he says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So what's he saying? That as we approach the end, the closer we get to the second coming of Christ, the Bible says that wicked people are going to get worse and worse. Sin is going to abound in the last days. Let's look at the list here. It says in verse 1, this know also in the last days perilous or dangerous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And we can see these characteristics in America today in 2015 abounding more and more. When you think about how people are lovers of their own selves, we live in such a self-absorbed society where people are constantly just thinking about themselves and looking within themselves and they're so wrapped up in themselves where they can't uh, pay attention to what's going on with the people around them. It's just all about me and the decisions that they make don't take into account how they affect other people, but it's just about their happiness. And I just want to be happy. And our world even teaches us that this is a virtue to be true to your own self and, and to, to do what makes you happy and find happiness in this world. And it's all about you being fulfilled and happy. And you know what you find is that these people are never fulfilled. Because anybody who lives a self-centered, self-absorbed, loving of your own self kind of a life is going to be miserable because you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to achieve your state of fulfillment that you're trying to reach. But the Bible tells us that people will be lovers of their own selves. And what's that going to lead to? Being covetous. You know, where you just desire more stuff for yourself, more money for yourself, more goods. You know, who cares about winning people to Christ? Who cares about helping other people or, or you know, being a good example to other people? No, no, no. It's just about how much stuff I can get. It's just about how much fun I can have, how much pleasure I can enjoy. 
and coveting everything that we can't have. He says, lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, just bragging about how great they are and how wonderful they are and how much money they have and how successful they are and how smart they are. Proud, blasphemers. And of course, if you're proud and if you're self-absorbed, of course you're going to be blasphemous. You're not going to give God the respect that he deserves because the only one you have respect for is yourself because you think you're so wonderful. He says, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And of course, we see that today in the United States where children don't have the same respect that they had for their parents that they once did. A big reason for that is, of course, the fact that less and less parents are spanking their children. Amen. And so the, the children run roughshod over the parents because the parents have no recourse. The children rebel and spit in their face, and all the parents can do is just, mm, I don't know, what do I do? You know, kids are kids. And they, well, I, you know, I find that a better punishment is to take away the Xbox. I don't even know if that's even still, is that even still the video game system? What are we on, PS 10,000 by now? You know, oh, I just take away his PS2, you know, I just take away the Xbox. You know what? No, he needs his, ha his hide tanned. You know, oh, well, you know, I'll just take away my 12-year-old cell phone. It's like, what it, why does your self, why does your 12-year-old even have a cell phone for it to even take away as a punishment? But it's like, I'll just take away their cell phone. I'm just going to take away my 11-year-old's iPad. That'll show them. You know, a bunch of spoiled brats today, and that type of discipline does not work. You know what works? A spanking, what God said would work. The Bible says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat. Amen. Thou shalt beat. Amen. It says, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Amen. Let those three words sink down into your ears, my friend. <laughs> but the Bible says that in the end, you know, they'll be disobedient to parents. And think about this with spoiled brats. Unthankful. Yeah. Yeah. Unthankful. Meaning that they have no gratitude for what they get because they're given everything and they're, they're, their parents never tell them no and so they're ungrateful for it, they're unthankful, they don't even appreciate that which they do have. You say, well I just want my kids to be happy so I just give them whatever they want. That's not gonna make anybody happy. Getting whatever you want makes you a spoiled brat, unthankful and unholy. Yeah. It says, without natural affection. You know, what does it mean to be without natural affection? Well, Romans 1 used the term vile affections. Yeah. You know, natural affection is basically when a man is attracted to a woman. That's natural affections. Basically, a man gets married to his wife and they two are one flesh and the man desires a physical union with his wife and the wife desires a physical union with her husband. That's natural affection. That's normal. But without natural affection is saying that basically that's not the, 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 the union that they desire. They desire anything else. All kinds of filthy, perverted unions. You know, see Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 for a rundown of all the filthy imaginations of mankind. But the Bible says that they'd be without natural affection. Of course, we see that. Truce breakers. These are people who would make an agreement. They would make a deal, and then they would break that agreement. They would break their word. The Bible says false accusers. And this is a big one today where people just falsely accuse people at the drop of a hat without any evidence. Well, you're just this, and you're just doing this. And I mean, I can't even count all the times I've been falsely accused, where people will just make things up, just out of nowhere, just accusations fly. And the Bible said that in the last days, there would be false accusers abounding. He says incontinent. That's people who can't contain themselves, people who can't control the lust of the flesh, and they just let their desires run rampant, and, if, and whatever they want, they're going to gratify their lust. Fierce, and watch this, despisers of those that are good. He says in the last days, people are going to hate those who are good. Yeah, right. They're going to hate you for being a good person. They're going to hate you for being moral or righteous or godly. He says that they are despisers of those that are good. He says traitors. Heady, high-minded, and heady and high-minded are kind of the same thing in a way. Proud, puffed up, vain in their own mind. And then he says, lovers of pleasures 
more than lovers of God. So what's the Bible describing here when it describes the last days? It describes a time when sin is going to abound, and the Bible says in the same chapter that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. There are going to be just people abounding who hate God, who hate the people of God, who despise those that are good, who persecute the people of God, and who just only care about themselves, their own lust, their own covetous desires, and just about praising themselves, lifting up themselves. Look, we live in that day, if we look around, where people are self-absorbed. It's funny, when we, were, uh, when we were interviewing these Jewish rabbis for Marching to Zion, you know, we wanted to get the whole spectrum, you know, so we contacted every rabbi we could. So we talked to the Orthodox rabbi, the Reform rabbi, the Conservative rabbi, and one guy we talked to was a humanist, leader, a humanist Jewish leader. And so, you know, I said, what does that mean to be a humanist rabbi? And he said, well, here's the thing. We basically don't necessarily believe in God. So he said, we, but we like all the religious services of being a Jew. You know, we like to do the, the, the Hanukkah and the bar mitzvah and all, you know, we like that. So here's what we do. We go and we do a worship service where we replace God with ourselves. So basically, instead of praising God, this is what he literally told me. He said, instead of praising God, we praise ourselves. So in all their hymns, all their liturgy, all the praise, every time God is mentioned, they remove the name of God and they replace it with us, mankind, ourselves. Is that just amazing? I mean, I couldn't even believe what I was hearing. But isn't that what the Bible said would come? You know, just, just lovers of their own selves. Just, just covetous, boasting. Bla I mean, how blasphemous. It'd be like if you took the hymns, right, and replaced them with yourself. Praise me, praise me, tell of my excellent greatness. Sing, O earth, my wonderful love proclaim. Hail me, hail me, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to my holy name. I am coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto myself belong. I mean, can you imagine coming to church and singing that? Wouldn't that just be bizarre and ridiculous? But that's what they do. It's real. It's in Phoenix. Humanist Jewish congregation. He, I said, can you give me some examples? And he read me some liturgy where they praise themselves. What in the world? But we live in this narcissistic, self-absorbed, self-glorifying society where it's just all about us and just us living a wonderful life for ourselves and, and just having everything that we want instead of us laying down our lives for the brethren or enduring all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. Why don't we do it for the sake of, of souls to be saved? and live our life as parents for our children, and live for our wife, you know, lay down our, be willing to lay down our life for our wives, and, and basically uh, care about other people, instead of just lifting ourselves up, you know, uh, and, and our own ambitions, instead of furthering the gospel, and helping other people achieve the things that God has for them, etc., etc. So this is what we see here, a time where sin abounds and people are very focused on themselves and they're not giving God the glory. They're worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. So that's what we see. But nextly, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. So the first thing I want you to see about the last days in the Bible is that number one, it's going to be a time when sin is going to increase. Sinners are going to get worse. Wicked people, reprobate people, they're going to get worse and worse, and people are going to begin to despise those that are good. I mean, you, wouldn't you think that even worldly sinful people would still like good people? I mean, even if they don't want to be good themselves, you'd think they'd still look at somebody who's good and respect that, and like, but they don't. They don't. They never have. Because the Bible says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. So when someone else's deeds are evil, 
they're going to hate the righteous and despise those that are good because it makes them feel guilty. You know, it shines the light on their own sinful heart. But secondly, not only will it be a time of, of great sin and iniquity and self-centeredness, selfishness, uh, number two, it will be a time when the doctrines of the Bible will be scoffed at in the last days. He says specifically that the second coming of Christ, the biblical creation and the flood, those three things specifically will be scoffed at in the last days. Look at your Bible there. In verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. So this ties into the first point. You see, it starts with point number one. It doesn't start with scoffing at the Bible. No, it starts with being a very sinful person, a very covetous person, a person who's filled with lust and self-centered desire and doesn't care about anyone but themselves. See, that person who's filled with lust is then going to find a doctrine to fit their lust. Yeah. See, they don't find doctrine and then decide, okay, how am I going to live my life? No, they decide how they want to live their life for themselves. And then they say, okay, now let's find the doctrine to go with it. So they start out with ungodly lust. Then, then they, they have the audacity to scoff at the promises of the Bible because they don't fit their lifestyle. Why do ungodly people hate the Bible? Because it condemns their lifestyle. Yeah. The Bible says this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Yeah. For everyone that doeth truth cometh to the light. It says that his deeds may be made manifest that they're wrought in God. But it says he that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither come to light lest his deeds should be reproved. He doesn't want his deeds to be reproved. Jesus said, you know, uh, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify thereof that the, that the works thereof are evil. He said, that's why the world hates me, because I'm testifying that the works of people are evil. They don't want to hear that. So, therefore, they scoff at the... It's not that there's just all this evidence for the Big Bang. There's all this evidence for evolution. There's all this evidence that everything came from nothing. I mean, don't you see all the evidence that everything came from nothing? That it all just exploded and here it is? And guess what? If you don't believe it, you're an idiot. You know, it's all here by accident, okay? Just shut up and believe it because I said... I mean, that's what the world will tell you. Hey, just believe. Just believe that everything came from nothing. And if you don't, you're not scientific. Look, how is it not scientific to say... It came from something. It can't just be here from nothing. Yeah. But that's what they'll tell you. But it's not because of the fact that they just objectively, I mean, they just had no agenda. They just, you know, looked at the evidence and just came to the conclusion that everything just came from nothing by itself. No, what it is that they decided, I hate God. Right. That's yeah. the first step. Yeah. I hate the Bible. I hate God. Amen. I don't want to obey God's rules. I don't want to live a clean life. I don't want to get married to a woman and, and have kids and, and, and be godly and go to church and read my Bibles. So they say, you know, I want to go out and commit a bunch of sin. And this book isn't compatible with that. So I'm going to write my own book. And everybody that's an atheist will say, ah, you just believe everything that's written in that book. Yeah. And, and who wrote your science textbook? Yeah. Well, the Bible's written by man. Well, who wrote your science textbook? They act like it's written by the finger of God. Yeah. Because if they pull out a science textbook, literally, they will just say, like, hey, every word of this right. is fact. I mean, they'll hold up a science book and tell you, this is all true. You know? And then we hold up the Bible and say, hey, this is all true. Well, you know what? I like the Bible better. Yeah. And <laughs> you know what? The Bible makes a lot more sense than the book that says, you know, well, at first there was nothing, and then it exploded. You know, it's like, okay, what, what are we doing here? And they love, to they love to show you a drawing of a monkey. Ah, oh, wasn't a monkey, it was Nick. Shut up. It doesn't matter whether it was an ape, a monkey, an orangutan, a chimpanzee. It doesn't matter what it was. It's just as stupid. Amen. It doesn't matter what it was, okay? But, let, you know, a gorilla, for crying out loud. But, you know, they, sh they love to show some monkey or ape or whatever the stupid thing is slowly turning into a human being. Right? But I, that, I don't want to see, I want to see nothing slowly turning into something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I would rather see, I'd rather see nothing turn into the first living organism. 
You know, because they, ah, oh, it all starts from a single-celled organ. Yeah, except that a single-celled organism is really complicated. Yep. Yeah. Hello? Do you remember in science when you'd study the paramecium and the amoeba? Remember the paramecium looks like a shoe footprint? And then the amoeba is a little more of just a round blob. And you look at the amoeba and the paramecium, and they're pretty complicated, actually. So I want to see the diagram where nothing or just, you know, primordial soup or whatever, liquids or gases or whatever, just the early sludge of the earth, I'd like to see those components, the proteins or the whatever, you know, I'd like to see all that stuff just form itself into that amoeba. Where's that chart? Where's that poster? Where's the poster how DNA formed? I mean, DNA is really complicated. And every living thing has DNA. Where did it come from? How could it evolve? Show me the chart. You don't have a chart. But what you do have is a big paycheck, a fancy car, and the respect of all your students who think of you, oh, thou gray ponytailed one, you know every, you know, down at ASU and, you, you know, when you're teaching the science class. But you know what? It's not fact, friend. It's fiction. It's fables. Amen. And so the Bible says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Scoffing at something is when you would make a mockery at it. Scoffers walking after their own lusts. What's the motive to scoff? your own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. So again, this is something where they decided that they didn't want to believe in it. Not because of the evidence. It says they're willingly ignorant. They purposely blind their minds to the truth. He says, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So, Christ's coming is a certainty. It's going to happen. Amen. The Bible says that, you know, though he tarry, though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come and will not tarry. Amen. And so this here says that people will scoff saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, a lot of people will look at these scriptures that I showed you about being in the last days and try to say, <laughs> and they would try to say that, you know, oh, well, they thought it was going to happen in their lifetime. Everybody in the Bible, the whole New Testament acts like it was going to happen in their lifetime. But in reality, it says here that people are going to scoff and then God's explanation to the people that are scoffing is that with him a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Doesn't that seem to indicate that more than a thousand years is going to go by yeah. before they're going to start saying? Because here's the, if, it, if Christ were to have come, you know, a hundred years after the time of the apostles, would it really make sense to say, well, where is the promise of his coming? Since the beginning of the creation, all things continue as they were, you know. No, it makes more, and, and then for him to say, well, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. That makes it sound like it's going to be thousands of years <laughs> before Christ would return to where people would think, hey, it's been a really long time. And he says, well, hey, there's a reason why he's waiting. What's the reason? The Bible says the Lord is not slack, verse 9, concerning his promise. It's not that God is just slacking. Like, you know, I've been meaning to return. One of these days I'm coming back. You know, you know, some people will keep saying they're going to do something and they just kind of never get around to it. Yeah. That's, I guess, he, he's saying God's not like that. He's not up in heaven, just kind of slack about it and just, oh, I guess I got to return sometime, but later. No, it says he's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he says, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I believe that what he means by that is that basically he's waiting and giving more people a chance to be saved. Yeah. 
more people a chance to be saved. Okay. Because if he were to return before people could get saved, you know, then they missed out. So he's long suffering. And, and my third point is going gonna, is gonna to touch on that as well. But he's long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And why does he compare it unto a thief in the night? He says, because when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The thief in the night analogy is that he said, look, if the watchman would have known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He's saying if a thief is going to be successful, they come at an hour that you think not. They don't let you know, hey, I'm going to break into your house at 1.30 a.m. Because then you're going to be ready at 1.30 a.m. with the shotgun cocked and, and loaded and ready. And you're not going to suffer your house to be broken up. But he says that the thief comes at an hour that you think not. He comes in the night. And that's what Christ's coming will be. He said, at such an hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. That's why when you see people predicting it, you know it's false. Because he says it's going to be an hour that you think not that he comes. So when you see people sitting there and saying, you know, oh, these blood moons, John Hagee is, is telling us all about it. Or, you know, oh, you know, these are all, it's going to happen in September because the blood moons, you know, the Jewish calendar, you know, Hach, Hach Flem. And, and, and told, Rabbi Hach Flem told me that, you know, it's kind of, but here's the thing. Then I can tell you, I cannot tell you when Christ will come because no man knoweth the day or the hour. Only the Father knoweth. But I can tell you certain days that he will never come. Because any day where, where a preacher comes out and makes a date, I promise you he will not come on that day for sure. Amen. Fact. So, like, we could make a calendar of all the days he's not going to come. <laughs> because any prediction where somebody comes out and says, you know, he's coming in 2017, September 21st, it's just like, cross that date off the calendar. Not going to happen. Because there's, cause then it would make... God a liar when he sits there and says, hey, nobody knows. And then it's like, oh, I figured it out. I did the math. No, there's no math. Look, you, thought, you don't think Jesus knew math? He even said, the son doesn't know. Only the father knoweth. In Mark 13, he said, neither the son, but the father only. So it's at such an hour that we think not that the son of man is coming. It's going to come upon them suddenly in words. But he says unto us as Christians, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It's not going to be a thief on the night to believers. Because he says, you know, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. But unto those that are sleeping, it will come as a thief in the night. But he tells us as believers not to sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So he is allowing uh, time to go by to the tune of thousands of years before the second coming, but it is still certainly coming. Yet in these last days, people scoff at the Bible and they scoff at the second coming of Jesus Christ and they scoff at the creation and the flood and they teach this myth of the Big Bang and evolution, etc. It's according to their own lust. This is why I don't get wrapped up in a big thing of, hey, let's prove evolution false and let's, let's spend our days and nights you know, researching and doing science and digging up and excavating because if we could just prove evolution false, we get so many people saved. Because here's the thing, people were dying and going to hell before evolution was ever invented. Yeah. Evolution is new. You think everybody was saved before evolution came out? No, they weren't. And not only that, but the Bible says that they're willingly ignorant. So why would I show evidence to somebody who's willingly ignorant? That sounds like a waste of my time. Yeah. They're doing it after their own lust. They want to believe that there's no God. They're going to believe that no matter what you show them. And that's why we need to focus on the gospel because the Bible says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. And so we need to focus on preaching the gospel and not on, if we can just prove the science, they're never going to see it. They're never going to believe in it. It doesn't matter what, they won't be persuaded even if one rose from the dead. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Yeah, right. If they won't hear God's word, then they cannot be saved. And I always tell people when I'm out soul winning and they, you know, want to see the proof, they want the evidence. I say, well, you know what? If you're waiting for the evidence, if you're waiting for the proof, then you will die and go to hell. Yeah, yeah. 
and you will never be saved because there is no evidence. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and faith is the evidence of things not seen. You have to believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You say, well, faith in what? Blind faith? No, faith in the word of God. The most amazing book on this planet that's been translated into every language that has power in every page. Yeah. And anybody can read this book and see, never man spake like this man. Amen. And the words of Jesus Christ are not like the words of Muhammad. They're not like the words of Joseph Smith or like the words of Buddha or anybody else. You know, the words of Jesus Christ are unparalleled. The words of God in this book have power. And the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I don't know about you, but I find that the vast majority of people, when I'm out knocking doors and soul winning, you know, evolution's not even their hangup. Yeah. Unless you're on the university, you know, where everybody's professing themselves to be wise and have become fools. Yeah. But if you go to the actual normal people in this world, just, you know, living in neighborhoods and houses and apartments, you know, most people don't believe in evolution and Big Bang and all that. They just need to be taught the gospel of yeah. Jesus Christ so that they can believe on it. But thirdly this, go to Daniel chapter 11. We're talking about the last days. What's it going to be like in the last days? You know, how do we know if we see the day approaching? First of all, God said it would be a time when sin would abound and evil men and seducers would get worse and worse. And it would be a time when people would just love their own selves and just sin and, and, and do all kinds of wickedness with no regard for parents, no regard for the Lord or his word or anything like that. Number two, we saw there would be a time when they would scoff at and mock the Bible. They'd make fun of creation, make fun of the flood, make fun of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. And of course, we see these things around us today in modern America. But thirdly this, according to the last days, there will be God's people in the last day. This is another characteristic of the last days in the Bible is that God's people will do great works for God. I believe that the greatest works for God will be done in the last days. I think that the most souls will be won in the last days. This is what I firmly believe. Let me show you some scriptures here. This is Daniel chapter 11, which is about the tribulation. It's about the, the very end. And it says in Daniel 11:31, 31, an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Now, the reason I read that verse is because this is an event that Jesus Christ talks about because he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Whoso readeth, let him understand. That's what he says in Matthew 24, a chapter about the tribulation. That's what he says in Mark 13. And here it is. It says right here, the abomination of desolation. So that gets our bearings of where we are in the timeline. And such as do wickedly, verse 32, against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God are going to be weak and lukewarm and watered down. Is that what it says about, the, about God's people in the last days? They're going to be helpless. They're going to be weak. They're not going to be as great as previous Christians. No. It says they, the people that do know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. Exploits. Great works. That's what an exploit is. It's some great work, some great achievement is known as an exploit. It says in the next verse, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Oh, there's going to be persecution. Make no mistake. But doesn't the Bible clearly say that in the last days, God's people will do great exploits and will instruct many. Now, this is something that's often overlooked. You know, people, people are often preaching. I'm sure I'm not the only pastor this morning who's getting up and preaching about how wicked the last days are going to be. You know, I guarantee you there are other pastors across America right now that are in 2 Timothy chapter 3 right now talking about, hey, look, this is the last days. Look what it's going to be like. I guarantee you that there are a multitude of pastors 
In 2 Peter 3 right now, talking about how in the last days people will scoff at the second coming. They'll scoff at the creation. They'll scoff at the flood. But one that you don't hear as much about. I'm sure that there's another preacher right now somewhere in the world preaching about Daniel 11 also. But I, I just don't hear as much about the great things for God that are going to be done in the last days. You hear more about the fact, hey, the world's going to get bad. But how about the fact that God's people are going to do the greatest works? Well, amen. I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. And also this is taught in the New Testament. Now, first of all, we see it right there in Daniel chapter 11. But if you go to Matthew 24, because remember, Matthew 24 brings up the abomination of desolation. And then right after it says the abomination of desolation, in the next breath, he says that those that know God are going to be strong in this time and that they're going to do exploits and they're going to instruct many. Well, what does the Bible say? In Matthew 24, in the same scripture about the abomination, it says in verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, but what's the verse right before that? Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, isn't that interesting that he brings that up? Now, I personally believe... And I don't have any doubt about this. I personally believe that the gospel has already been preached unto every nation of this world at some time or another. In fact, repeatedly throughout history. You know, I think if you look back over the history of the world over the last 2,000 years, multiple times the gospel has come, even places where we would think that's a really non-Christian place. That's a place where the gospel is not being preached. But throughout history, the gospel has gone into these places not once, not twice, but repeatedly. Even I don't care what place you want to talk about, whether it's Korea, China, Japan, Mongolia, India. You know, the gospel has circled the globe and then circled it again and then circled it again. And then you say, well, what about the, the jungles of Africa? Look, there's probably been more missionaries sent to Africa than any other place. Don't tell me about some guy in Africa who hasn't heard the gospel. Good night. There have been more missionaries to Africa probably than anywhere. I mean, that's the classic place that if you're going to be a missionary, you better be going to Africa, right? I mean, that's like the most classic place to be a missionary. The bottom line is that throughout history, the gospel has gone into all these places. But here's the thing. In a lot of places, the gospel hasn't been there in a while. There have been generations and generations where there's been almost nobody preaching that. They might still have heard of Jesus, but there are places where the gospel was generations ago and where it's been forgotten. And there are also many places where even though the name of Jesus is named, it doesn't mean that it's the true gospel because there's another gospel and another Jesus. There's another gospel that says that salvation's by works. You know, there's another Jesus who's not the son of God. Okay, and so there are a lot of people who have a corruption and a perversion. Uh, obviously, a lot of these Africa missionaries are preaching a false gospel. Yeah. There's no question about that. So I'm not saying that everybody has a clear presentation of the gospel. I'm not saying that people don't need to go because, listen, we need to go and we need to get the gospel to all nations. That's what the Bible teaches. And people are dying and going to hell because no one's given them a clear presentation of the gospel. And in many places that once had even the Word of God in the New Testament, they don't even have the New Testament anymore, but they had it in the past. But they don't have it anymore. And what I believe that this is saying in Matthew 24, I don't think he's saying, hey, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. That means that once it gets to the last nation, you know, once that last language, here's the gospel, you know, then Christ can return. You know what? That's already happened, in my opinion. It's already, and look, they may not have it today, but I believe that the gospel has circled the globe and circled the globe and circled the globe, and that these people in the past have heard it. Okay, even if they're not necessarily hearing it today. What I believe that this is saying in Matthew 24, if you actually look at the verse there in verse 14, where he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I believe is saying that in the last days, at the very end, it's going to go to all nations again. Everybody's going to get a final chance. 
I think that that's what he means when he says people are going to instruct many and they're, they're going to do great exploits and there are going to be uh, people in every nation that hear the gospel, then the end comes. You know, it sounds to me like a succession right there of, hey, it's preached in all the nations and then the end comes. That in the last days, there's going to be more soul winning and more preaching of the true gospel of Jesus Christ than ever in the history of mankind. That's what I believe the Bible teaches. And so the reason I bring this up, and if you would flip over to Revelation chapter 3, the reason that I bring this up is because a lot of people who've come under the influence of this false doctrine of dispensationalism have gotten this warped view of the end times. And here's what their view of the end times is. Their view is that basically in the end times, God's people, Christians, are going to be lukewarm. And they call this the Laodicean church age. We are living in the Laodicean church age. There is no such thing as the Laodicean church age. It's a lie. It's a fraud. And what they do is they say, well, you know, the reason God's people are so lukewarm is because we're living in the Laodicean age. No, speak for yourself if you want to be lukewarm. There are people in this world today that are red hot, soul winning, fired up, servants of God that want to be strong, that want to do exploits, that want to instruct many, that want to preach the gospel to every creature, and this down in the mouth, defeated, just waiting for some pre-trib rapture to rescue you and saying, well, we're living in the land of sin, church age. It's a lie. It's false. It's not true today. And it comes from this fraud, the Schofield Reference Bible, written by a man who is a corrupt fraud. A man who left his wife and married somebody else and then wants to pass her a church. A man who is uh, so, so fraudulent as a lawyer, he has to keep moving around and stuff. Because he keeps being sued as a lawyer. He's a corrupt man who hung around with a bunch of corrupt businessmen who put a bunch of money in his pocket to teach lies for the Zionists. Okay, And so this Schofield Reference Bible, if you open it up, Two, Revelation 2 and 3, it'll tell you that these are seven church ages. And it even gives you the years. And it gives you the different years. And so what they have down for us is, of course, we're Laodicea, you know. But they put down these other years and they'll put down that Philadelphia, the one that comes right before Laodicea, they'll put down Philadelphia as like, you know, in the eight, late 1700s, early 1800s or whatever, you know, there's all these revivals going on, all the missions movement and everything. And they say, hey, that was the great door and effectual to spread the gospel. And then they'll put, you know, from such and such the year until the present is Laodicea, lukewarm, God wants to spew it. No, God wants to spew you out of his mouth, okay? But he doesn't want to spew everybody out of his mouth. See, the truth of the matter is that there's no such thing as the universal church. So, so to sit there and say the Laodicean church is made up of all believers. No, it's made up of a bunch of losers. Yeah. You know, and here's the thing. Every church has a different personality. Yeah. And see, those seven churches are not seven church ages. Okay. Those seven churches are seven example churches. And any church could go through stages where it's like any of those churches. I mean, if you've lost the first love, you're like Ephesus. If you're lukewarm, you're like Laodicea. If you're being persecuted, you're like Smyrna. You know, if you have the doctrines of Balaam, you're like Pergamos, okay? If you have fornication, being allowed and women preachers, you're like Thyatira. You know, if you have a name that you live, but you're dead, if you're living in the past, you're like Sardis. If you have a great door open and effectual unto you, and you have the synagogue of Satan breathing down your neck, you're like Philadelphia. And if you're lukewarm, and you think that you're so rich and you think that you're so cool, then you're like Laodicea. But any church could go through phases where they let sin come in or where they lose the first love or where they do whatever. It's examples. These are example churches. They're not church ages. And this doctrine is so damaging to God's people because it teaches a defeatist mentality where we approach the work of God as, well, you know what? We just got to hang in there until he comes. I mean, we can't really expect to do anything great for God because, you know, Philadelphia is over. You know, we just got to kind of hang in there through this Laodicean church age. And, you know, I can't really preach hard because, you know, I'm dealing with a bunch of Laodiceans here. 
So I can't really preach on Can't really expect people to do a lot of soul winning. I mean, it's Laodicea, folks. That's a really damaging doctrine. Yes. Because what we ought to do is say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In the last days, God's people will be strong and do exploits and instruct many. I want to fulfill that prophecy. I want to be a part of it. Amen. I want to be one of those people. Or we could just sit there and say, oh, it's Laodicea. Go to John chapter 14. It's a false doctrine, my friend. It's false for a lot of reasons. A lot of things wrong with this church age. And it's funny because when you look at it, I wish I had a Schofield uh, reference by it. Maybe I do have one. Let me see. What do you know? It's right here. Let me pull this, let me pull this thing out. The message to Laodicea, the final state of apostasy. But here's what I think is funny about this, too, is that, you know, when he's teaching these church ages, he says, you know, Ephesus is the apostolic age. And then he says, the message to Smyrna is the period of great persecutions up to A.D. 316. The message to Pergamos, listen to this, the church under imperial favor settled in the world, A.D. 316 to A.D. 500. So here's what he's basically saying that the Roman Catholic Church is the true church. That's basically what he's saying here. Because he's saying that the church, because he thinks the church is made up of all Christians. He doesn't believe it's a local congregation of believers assembled. So he says that the church is under imperial favor. What empire? Rome? So this is when, this is when the Roman Empire loves the church. Um, the Roman Empire never loved the real God's people. Yeah. Because God's true people have never been loved of the world. He said, they hated me, they'll hate you. He said, the disciple's not above his master, neither the servant above his Lord. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more so they call him of his household? How can you sit there and say, oh, you know, up until 500 AD, they're under imperial favor. So they're being persecuted for hundreds of years, and then for hundreds of years, it's just, do, 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 just relax, and the world <laughs> loves you. Look, this is a fraud. The Catholic Church shouldn't even be factored in. Here's the thing. God's writing to seven churches. These are actually churches that actually preach the gospel. All seven of them, or he wouldn't even be writing to them. He wouldn't be saying, hey, I'm going to remove the candlestick if you don't repent. Because they never even had the candlestick. When you're a Roman Catholic Church, you never had the candlestick. Amen. You're not a church of Jesus Christ. And God's not even talking to you. Except to just say, you know, come out of you. You know, except just to say you're a whore. I mean, he's not talking to you and saying, you know what? I know your works. I know the good things you're doing, but I have a few things against you. A few things against you? They don't even believe that salvation is by faith. They're bowing down and worshiping a statue of a woman. Oh, Mary, help us. Hail Mary, full of grace. Swing those beads all over the place. You know, they're basically worshiping idols, worshiping a woman, yeah. teaching, hey, baptism saves. Hey, the sacraments save. It's nothing to do with Christianity and the, and the true word of God. Kissing the, bip, the, the Pope's big toe and saying that he is the vicar of Christ on earth. Say, well, they weren't bad, as bad back then. But here's the thing, though. They were lying heretics who started the Roman Catholic Church. Yep. Even in 313 A.D. with Constantine and, and all these different guys. So to sit there and, and, and take this seriously, you know, and think, oh, yeah, you know, these are the seven church ages. And we're in Laodicea, the final state of apostasy. Laodicea. No, because people who are apostates are not even a church that Christ would even have anything to do with. Yeah. The Laodicean church is not an apostate church. The Laodicean church is a lukewarm church, but they still believe the gospel. It, otherwise, why would he even be talking to them? I mean, you think Jesus is like, okay, Mormon church, I have a few things against you. <laughs> All right, Buddhist temple, I have a few things against you. Okay, Jehovah's Witnesses. No, because they're not even on his radar. Right. He's going to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Amen. He's not going to say, hey, I know your works. I know you. No, he doesn't even know you. If he knew you, you'd be saved. Right. Look at John chapter 14, verse 11, because I want you to understand this powerful truth that is found in John 14, 11 through 13. 
Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Don't miss this powerful statement in verse 12, where he says, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now listen, you can't do anything better than Jesus, can you? Who here thinks they're better than Jesus? Good night. But yet Christ is saying that those who believe on him would do greater works than he did. How can that be? Well, here's the thing. It cannot mean quality because no one can do greater works as far as a better quality than Jesus because Jesus was perfect. Jesus went about doing good. They said he doeth all things well. And so no one could excel Christ's works for quality. So when it says, the works that I do shall he do and greater works, he's not saying that they're better. Greater in the Bible, usually the words great or greater are referring to size or quantity. When the Bible used the word great, that's how it's usually being used. Size, quantity. And so when the Bible says, the works that I do shall he do and greater works. You know, if you think about it, the apostles did greater works than Jesus, not better than him, but they just did more. They accomplished more. They preached the gospel to more people than Jesus Christ did. Now, that right there shows us that God desires us to do great works and that we have the capability to do great works and that the sky is the limit. So we need to get off this Laodicea mentality and we need to get on the Daniel 11 mentality and the Matthew 24 mentality and the Mark 13 mentality that says that the gospel must first be published among all nations. And no published does not mean like publishing books and tracts. Published means preached, proclaimed. And so we need to understand that today in 2015, we are ready to do the greatest works that this world has ever seen. Why don't you get excited about that? You know, why don't we go out there and preach the gospel to more people and get more people saved than have ever been saved in the history of mankind? And I don't want to read about somebody from the 1700s and read about somebody from the 1800s. I don't want it to be said of us like it was said of David's mighty men where he said, yeah, David's mighty men were great. Those three guys were great. But he said, they weren't like the previous three, though. You remember that? He said, you know, the three men, they were mighty. They did great exploits, but they attained not unto the first three. So basically, the author there is lamenting and saying, you know what, the good old days. Man, back in the good, you know, I mean, yeah, these mighty men today, but let me tell you something, the mighty men back when I was coming up were greater than. I don't want to hear that. Amen. I don't believe that. I think that we have the capability to be the greatest generation. Not of the, oh, look, not as America. Good night. This is the filthiest, most wicked generation America has ever seen. Yeah. But as God's people. And so the true story about the end times, it's not about the world getting real wicked and about God's people kind of getting lukewarm and watered down. No, here's the true story. God's people are going to do the greatest works of all time and the world's going to get really wicked and they're going to get more different than they've ever been which explains all the persecution. Yeah. You know, because when you got people that are rising up and doing the greatest works, and then you got a world that's more wicked than ever, that's where the clash is going to come from. So be inspired, my friend. Be motivated. And there are great works to do. And we all need to get involved in doing it. And it starts right here in Phoenix, Arizona, we have more people to preach the gospel to right here in Phoenix, Arizona than lived in Jerusalem or anywhere else because this city is bigger than any city that even existed back in those days. There was no city of 4 million people back then. You know, we have a city of 4 million people right here that we can preach the gospel to and, and get them saved and knock doors and win souls to Christ. 
And you know what? There are other cities all over America where men need to be trained in this church and sent out to start churches in other cities in America and do great things. And yea, even men who would come out of our church and go start a church in a foreign country and do great works for God and reach a nation or reach a city or reach a state with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sky is the limit. We can do greater works. We can do great, ex it's already been prophesied. I mean, look, God knows the end from the beginning. Somebody's gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. Someone will do it or the Bible was not telling the truth. He said, the gospel is gonna be preached to all nations, then the end's gonna come. He's saying that because he already know, he's already seen it all. In Revelation, it's all laid, it's already happened. It's done. But the question is, are we going to be a part of it, number one? Question number two, how great, how great is it going to be? Because, you know, we know that some great work is going to be done for God in the last days. We know that many people will be saved. But here's the thing. If we get involved, then even more will be saved. I don't believe it's just, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I don't believe in Calvinism. Right. No, it's up to us to get on board with God's program. God's already predicted and said, hey, I already know some people will do it. There will be strong people who do great exploits. But you know what? Let's make sure that we're a part of it and that we push it and that we ride that wave and that we participate and get more people saved than any generation in the history of mankind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you for the shining light that it is in a dark world and in a crooked and perverse generation, Lord. Help us to stand as lights in the world. Help us not to get down in the mouth and say, oh, how can we raise our kids? How can we live? Lord, help us not to just try to maintain or hang on for dear life, but help us to take it to the enemy, Lord. Help us to go on the offense, Lord, and help us to go out and say, not only are we going to just exist and survive, but we're going to thrive and do great exploits for God, greater than ever in the history of mankind, Lord. Help us to be inspired as your people. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.